And it's my great pleasure to introduce Bruce Singer, who is going to talk today about small-scale multilingualism in a community in northern Arnhem Land in Australia. Ruth um, has an amazingly broad research spectrum and also an amazing array of affiliations, which I hope I will get right. So she is affiliated with the University of Melbourne and also the Australian National University in Canberra, where she collaborates with Nick Evans on his project, Wellsprings of Linguistic Diversity. And there was another project um, on information structure with... What's that? Is it? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. That's it for now. <laughs> and uh, she works, among other things, on the social linguistic and social sides of small-scale multilingualism, but also on structural properties of Warui, and since the noun class system. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be more occasions to talk to Ruth if you're interested in her research because she's currently visiting SOAS until December this year, so don't miss the opportunity if you want to hear more. And she will also give another talk mm -hmm. um, on the 2nd of December in a pre-conference session uh, of the upcoming Language Documentation and Linguistic Theory Conference at SOAS on Friday the 2nd of December in the workshop on small-scale multilingualism. So, now I'm handing over to Ruth. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the um, work I've been doing at Wadawi Community in um, Northern Australia um, over the last five years. Um, I'm going to look at it sort of uh, from two perspectives. One is the intergenerational view, uh, because basically I started working with older people who are now um, grandparents, great-grandparents, um, and then more recently been working with some of their um, grandchildren, so um, young women between uh, 13 and, and 20. Um, so the other um, sort of um, perspective is through the three phases of how I see it now, the three phases of the work, of the work in terms of uh, what I initially was doing in my research, um, then the second phase, which is um, still haven't analysed it that much. And then the third phase where I've sort of shifted my thinking a little bit and my approach. Um, so um, firstly, why I started looking at multilingualism at Wadawi is it's because it's quite unusual um, from the perspective of Australian Indigenous communities and also, I think, uh, increasingly worldwide, um, it's becoming unusual to um, have communities where people are multilingual in a lot of small languages. Um, so from working with children as well, which is something I, I won't be focusing on in this talk, um, it seems they grow up speaking at least two Indigenous languages in the home um, and then usually um, become proficient in more Indigenous languages when they get to um, adulthood. Um, and then people continue to learn languages over their lifespan as well. Um, so some of the questions um, that I've been asking about multilingualism at Wadawi is um, how do so many small languages coexist? So there's so many scenarios where people have documented language shift um, due to influence, particularly of you know, larger languages on smaller languages or more politically um, powerful languages on smaller ones. So how, um, how is it that all these small languages manage to coexist um, and have done so, um, it seems, um, for many um, millennia? So um, one of the questions is, is there um, particular ideologies or practices there that seem different to elsewhere that might be supporting this intensive linguistic diversity? Um, and the other um, thing we'll be looking at is their change across the generations. So a lot of people I've talked to who work in Australian Indigenous communities have said, yes, it is different, but maybe it's still going headed in the same direction as everywhere else. And it's just, uh, for some reason, uh, this multilingual... Um, situation has survived a bit longer than in other communities. Um, so just to orient yourselves a bit, here's a map of Australia um, and this little section here uh, is a part of what uh, is called the top end, um, colloquially. Um, and this is the regional capital, Darwin. Um, and this is Wadawi community on South Goulburn Island. Um, and some of the main um, languages spoken in this area and where um, the areas associated uh, traditionally with these languages. Uh, Maung, associated here with uh, a section of the coast and also the islands. 
Gunbalang uh, to the east, Iwaja to the west, and Gunungu inland. And just Manangrido over here is another um, community that's a lot bigger, um, which is the only other place uh, left in Australia where people have talked about these high levels of multilingualism. So just to give you a bit of an idea about the languages spoken, I'm going to be talking about three languages mainly, um, which are quite widely spoken, um, and then there's a lot of other languages which are spoken by smaller groups of people. Um, so one of the main languages I've worked with in the past is Maung, because what are we sort of seen as the homeland of Maung? Um, and so most Maung speakers are actually on the island. So what I'm indicating with this paler circle is um, the total number of speakers uh, else everywhere. And then with the inner circle, the number of speakers at Watawi. So most of the Maung speakers are at Watawi, and there's only a few hundred of them. Um, whereas this other language, Gunwingu, which is a um, variety of Binin Gunwok, um, there's more Binin Gunwok speakers elsewhere. Similarly, with Yungmata from the east, uh, it's quite a big language of a few thousand speakers. Um, and then um, there's a small number of speakers at Watawi, which I've put here do well, but there's speakers of other varieties as well. That's just the labels I'll be using for them in this talk. Um, and then some other languages in English, of course, which is spoken by a lot of people off the island. Um, and just to give you an idea of the genetic diversity, um, there's basically five language families represented, so four indigenous language families. Maung is in the Iwajan language family, and there's still a few speakers left of Iwaja, um, um, which is also in the same family. And then <coughs> these two languages are in the Gunwingun family. Manangridan family, um, there's people who speak these languages. Um, Yulmamata is in the Pamanyungan family, which is the largest family. It covers most of the Australian continent. Uh, it's quite different to these other language families, which are referred to as the non pamanyungan languages. Not that they form any kind of grouping. And then English, Germanic, and then also there is a Creole spoken from um, the northeast tip of Australia. There's just a few families who've settled at Watawi. Um, so Watawi is a little island, um, and it's, um, it's been settled now um, for 100 years. Um, so I'll talk later about the centenary of the establishment of the mission, um, which is something they celebrated recently. Um, we think Maung or a related variety was spoken there before. People talk about this language, Manangari, but we don't have any records, so we're not quite sure if it was a variety or a different language. Um, and it seems to have been a centre for... Um, people to settle, settle, stay there for a few months of the year, even before the missionary came. And he was attracted there because there was people camping there and working with Macassan fishermen who um, came every year from Indonesia. Um, so in terms of the three phases of the project that I'm going to talk about, um, one of the ideas I've been thinking about is different perspectives. Obviously, multilingualism, language use is a very slippery topic. What are people actually doing with language? Do they even know what they're doing? Mostly not. I mean, there's a lot going on and um, it's hard to get, um, you know, it's sort of impossible to get a complete picture or something like that. <coughs> so I started to think about it uh, in terms of the um, cross-section of a cell. Uh, for example, if you take a cross-section of a cell, uh, it doesn't really tell you that much about what the shapes are in there. So, for example, what they've done here is take multiple cross-sections and sort of reconstruct <laughs> this complex three-dimensional shape of a mitochondria, um, which... If you just looked at one section, you'd just see these little circles and think there was a couple of little spheres in there or something. Um, but to get this three-dimensional picture, you have to get all these different perspectives. Um, as it says in this textbook uh, <laughs> of cell biology, single thin sections sometimes give misleading impressions. So I guess that's what happened with the three phases. I, did a, you know, I get different perspectives on what was going on, especially working with different generations as well. And then I'd sort of think, oh, well, you know, was everything that... I got from the other perspective wrong or, you know, but actually you're just sort of continually shifting your perspective because you're not setting something as concrete as a cell though, unfortunately, uh, possibly more like the surface of the planet Jupiter <laughs> where you have all these gases moving around and uh, it's, it's, it's constantly dynamic, it's changing and so the idea of getting some, you know, accurate picture like you might get of a cell is, you know, obviously, um, you know, imaginary. Um, so the first phase, I basically took um, some ideas from the sociolinguistics of multilingualism, um, looking at how to explore language ide ideologies and language practices. So although I'd already been working at Watawi for 
um, about 10 years looking mainly at the Maung language, looking at structural aspects of the Maung language. Uh, it was interesting how much I learnt just starting with these techniques and starting to think about language use a bit more. Um, so one method I used with the, was the linguistic um, biography interview, where you basically start the interview with tell me about the languages you speak, how you learned them. So it's sort of like a biography, but from the perspective of languages. And I also used this language portrait task, uh, which was popularised by um, an Austrian linguist, linguist um, Brigitte Busch, where you ask people to colour in uh, an outline of the body um, <laughs> with uh, using different colours for different languages. Um, and so my focus in this section was um, repertoires. So I wanted to look at, you know, um, how predictable were repertoires? You know, did people who identified in certain ways, you know, all have similar repertoires? Um, and I also got interested in receptive multilingualism, which is a practice I'm going to talk about a bit, uh, which seems to be very widespread. Um, so to do that, I'm going to look at um, a couple, um, Nancy and Richard, uh, who I've worked with quite a bit over the years. Uh, initially, actually, we used to go hunting together because they had a boat and one time I went up there, I had a car with a tow bar. <laughs> so we used to collaborate on hunting. Um, <laughs> um, and then eventually started to work with them more. Um, so these are their language portraits. Um, as you can see, they're quite different. Basically, Nancy grew up at Watawi, whereas Richard moved there um, 30 years ago from eastern Arnhem Land, um, where they have quite a different, I guess, um, language ecology as well as speaking different languages. Um, so in hers, Nancy coloured in her head and chest with Maung. She identifies strongly with the Maung language as a Maung speaker. Um, and often with these language portraits, what they've found all around the world is, you know, language is just more important to someone there, more likely to put on the head and the chest, that kind of thing. Um, then she's put Gunwingo on one arm, um, which she speaks very fluently and which she learned um, from her mother. Um, although she said she only started to speak it really um, as, a, as a teenager. Um, and then Dual, um, her husband's language um, on the other arm, and then English. Um, she does a lot of work with English, uh, doing translating work and that kind of thing. Uh, some people don't put English on their portraits, but she did, um, and she's very proud of her English as well. Um, then on the legs, she's got some of these smaller languages, which aren't as widely spoken, but which she um, understands quite a lot. I'm not sure how much. Um, Gunbalang, Japana, Nakara from Man and Greta. Manangrida area, and then Iwaja. Um, then her husband's put on his head Jamba Puingu, which is what we were using um, to talk about um, Yulmumata um, varieties at one point. Um, he's put that on his head, and then he's put this um, Lia Yaga... Sorry, I don't speak these East Nanam, <laughs> so I have trouble pronouncing the name of his language. Lia Gala um, he's put that on his chest. And he actually, because he was um, brought up by people who weren't his birth parents, he's put his father's language on his head, um, although he says he doesn't really speak it. Um, and then he's put the language he grew up with on his chest, the orange one. Um, so one of the other things um, that came out from this work, which people found all around Australia, is this identification with the father's language um, and this concept of language ownership, that you own um, the language of your father and your father's father. And this is connected to your land ownership and your clan membership. Um, so this came through um, quite strongly um, as well in the interviews and that kind of thing. Um, and at Wadawi, as opposed to a lot of other communities, people usually do speak their father's language because they're so multilingual, whereas in a lot of communities nowadays, people actually don't speak their father's language and it may be that nobody speaks it, uh, but it's still an important um, aspect of their identity. And then um, he's also put a lot of other Eastern Arnhem Land varieties here, which are all what linguists would call um, Yulmata dialect group. So most of the ones he's put here would be um, relatively similar. Um, and then he's also put Gunwingul on his chest um, and Maung. So um, although he doesn't really speak Maung or Gunwingul, he understands Maung very well, as we'll see. Um, and he said he's starting to get quite good at Gunwingul too, um, which he also would have heard... Um, at Wadawi a lot since he moved there. So what is receptive multilingualism? Um, it's described generally as people having receptive competence in a language without being able to speak it. Um, and at Wadawi we find a lot of people like this, like Richard, understands Maung perfectly, people speak it to him all the time, um, but he doesn't really speak it. He'll use a phrase um, or a word, um, he's quite comfortable with that, um, but he won't, I've never heard him speak an entire sentence. Um, and he's quite similar to a lot of people who've moved from Eastern Arnhem Land in this way. Um, 
We can also talk about the receptive multilingual mode, which is a way of having a conversation where each person speaks a different language. And so they understand each other, but they choose to use a different language um, to the other person. Um, and interestingly, a lot, of this, um, a lot of work on this receptive multilingualism has ignored social factors up till now and focused on the idea that where you have similar languages, it's a sort of practical strategy. But obviously, as you can see, that these languages are from completely different families. Um, and it's not really a practical strategy because if you've been living together for 30 years, you could easily just start speaking one language. <laughs> um, but there has been some work on social factors recently. So, um, interestingly, um, Nancy does speak Yungmata um, quite fluently, um, but usually she chooses not to speak it to Richard. Uh, I have occasionally heard her switch into Yulmata when she's talking to him about something. I haven't been under—I don't understand Yulmata, so I don't know what they've been talking about. Um, and in this 25-minute conversation, um, which was recorded by Slomi Harris, another linguist I've been working with, um, there was, I think, um, six examples of Richard using a word in Mao, and then I think there was 11 examples of Nancy using a, a word or a phrase in Yulmata in Richard's language. Um, so basically, in a way, they're resisting code switching um, because Richard could have put a lot more words of Maung in. Nancy could have, you know, switched between Yungmata and Maung quite freely, um, but she doesn't. So in a sense, um, it's um, sort of um, also goes against the idea of accommodation that if we have a common language, we will use it, um, which in this situation and in most pairs of this kind that I've observed around Warawi, not just married couples, but also like two people working together on something around the town. And this is how they seem to actually, it seems to be the usual way um, for this kind of combination of people to talk together. Um, one of the things that maybe it has going for it is that it's symmetrical. With accommodation, someone has to shift to use the other person's preferred language. Um, whereas this, it's, there's something symmetrical about it. Um, obviously, Richard did have to learn to understand Maung, um, and Nancy maybe would have learn to speak Yulmata anyway, to speak to his family and stuff. Um, but there is a sense that um, there's a balance in the conversation. Um, I think at Wadawi, it may actually support the maintenance of smaller languages. This type of um, receptive multilingual mode is often associated with actual language loss. So we get the younger generation shifting to another language, and the older generation talks them in the heritage language, they'll talk back in um, the uh, language they're shifting to. But I think it could also be used to maintain smaller languages because people who speak Maung um, at Wadawi who want to keep speaking Maung and feel like if you're going to speak Maung anywhere, it should be happening at Wadawi because it's sort of the homeland of the language. Um, they can continue to do so um, and newcomers um, can speak in their own languages as well as much as they're understood. Um, also, I guess the benefits for newcomers like Richard is it's much quicker to learn to understand Maung and to learn to speak it. Um, and also, it may be in some sense avoiding some political um, contention, such as some people sometimes complain about all these people from Eastern Arnhem Land moving in, and they're seen as a bit of a threat because they're seen as a much more powerful group at the level of Arnhem Land, and even politically in Australia, there's a lot of political leaders coming from Eastern Arnhem Land. And they're also seen to have greater spiritual power, power and they lead a lot of ceremonies. So in a sense, they may be avoiding some politically loaded issues around with speaking Maung, which might be seen as part of claiming status there or, you know, political power on the island. So possibly um, these Eastern Arnhem Landers avoiding speaking Maung uh, may also um, help with some politi local politics. So basically with the phase one, I interviewed around 20 adults and I also did some work with children. Um, and I continue to interview people sporadically, but it's not so much the focus of my work anymore. Um, and I guess I learned a lot about repertoires, which turned out to be quite different and not that as predictable as I expected. Although obviously people from Eastern Arnhem Land more likely speak Eastern Arnhem Land language, Western Arnhem, that kind of thing. But even just looking across siblings who've grown up together, often quite different. Um, language ideologies and attitudes and language learning and use across the lifespan. Um, also, um, the idea of receptive multilingualism um, emerged as maybe something important that's going on there. Um, but obviously, in terms of the literature uh, around the world, I think the idea needs a bit of development. And I think that is happening because people have also been looking at social factors in its use, for example, in post-Soviet Ukraine and other places. <coughs> 
Um, and also, I guess, what became apparent is parallels to other sites of small-scale multilingualism, um, such as, for example, um, Friedrich is doing in um, Senegal and also other people are doing in Cameroon and other areas of the world. So um, phase two came about sort of partly by accident because of some other stuff I was doing, um, but it sort of um, created a way to work with young people a bit, um, which I hadn't so far. I'd worked sort of... I'd interviewed a few people um, sort of high school age, but not that many, and I had found a lot of them actually didn't really want to chat. <laughs> um, <laughs> but some of them did want to make films. <laughs> So it was a good way to do some work with them um, and it was part of um, development of this website we were doing anyway um, to try and um, put some resources online in Maung um, and make them accessible to people. Um, so basically um, there was four girls involved with this Nowhere Girls web series which they developed with a um, community filmmaker uh, who went up to make them with them. Um, and the brief for the filmmaker was basically make the films in Indigenous <coughs> languages. Um, so it was interesting sort of what came out of that um, idea. Um, and then just this year, I've been working with two girls who came down to Melbourne where I live um, to do high school, um, just working with them after school to make some sh short um, videos. <clears throat> so um, two of the videos that I made with... Um, the girls were at high school in Melbourne, um, Audrey and Tamia, um, and just from spending time with them um, in Melbourne, it, it's clear that the receptive multilingualism is something they're using as well. Um, basically, um, Audrey comes from a family where they identify very strongly with the Gunwingal language. Um, even though her family's been living for a couple of generations on Warawi, they still identify as, you know, coming from the mainland. And um, certainly... Um, her grandmother and her grandfather before that were very strong in making, trying to make the children just speak Gunwingu, um, even though they were playing with a lot of kids who were speaking Mao and other languages. Um, so that's Audrey's language portrait here. She coloured it mostly in yellow for Gunwingu and then put on her hand here Mao, although she does understand it perfectly. And she does speak it a little bit as well, but um, not that much. And then this is to me, as she's coloured in all in blue for Mao and then just put a little bit on the hand for Gunwingu. And so she probably understands um, Gunwingle perfectly too. Um, and she probably will speak it when she's older because um, most of her family, the adults, are bilingual in Maung and Gunwingle. So basically, um, the first video we did, uh, it was like a little um, interview where they interviewed each other about what had happened in the first week at school um, to put on a blog. So the audience was actually, in a way, um, the community back home. Um, that's how I sort of posed it to them, that people want to know what you're doing and stuff. Um, so in this first video, Audrey spoke um, Gunwingo and Tamiya spoke Maung, which is how they seem to be talking to each other mostly um, at that point. And um, then, interestingly, in the second video, um, Tamiya said she wanted to speak English. Um, and she identifies quite strongly with English um, because her mother <laughs> speaks English, mainly. Um, and I think she felt a bit funny about speaking Maung on the video because um, they were starting to settle into Melbourne and starting to feel like they didn't want to stand out, perhaps. Although people kept commenting on her English all the time, so I don't know how much that helped. <laughs> uh, and saying her English was very good, and she's like, I've been speaking English since I was born. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so interestingly, in both the videos, there's this receptive multilingualism going on. Although Tamiya changed languages, Audrey didn't. And so in the first video, um, they're speaking um, Gunwingu and Maung, and in the second one, they're speaking Gunwingu in English, and there's still the receptive multilingualism going on. The other thing I noticed just from <coughs> hanging out with them... Oh, sorry, I just decided to show the stills. Because I thought it's too many videos. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I know, they're so cute. <laughs> um, you can see the two videos on the blog there. <laughs> if you would like to see them later. Um, anyway, um, the other thing is that um, it was interesting just looking at that attitude to the use of English. I mean, one of the things I sort of claimed in phase one was... English is basically a last resort. Although English is a common language for everyone at Watawi, they tend not to use it and instead use, for example, receptive multilingualism or even have someone interpret. Um, although, of course, sometimes people do speak English to one another. Um, 
And among the young people, there definitely seemed to be a different attitude to the use of English. So they wouldn't necessarily use more English all the time, um, but they certainly enjoyed playing with English. And some of them, some of the younger generation does have an English-speaking parent, whereas the older generation, it's, it's pretty rare. I'm not, I can't really think of anyone off the top of my head. But um, the younger generation, there's um, Indigenous people who come from other parts of um, Northern Australia who've grown up speaking English or perhaps a Creole um, and who are using English with them at the home. And so they feel like, people like to me, I feel like it's their language. And even though they're often told not to use it, um, we'll use it and identify with it a lot more. So um, on to phase three. How am I going for time? Ah, pretty well. Um, so then in phase three, I started to get interested in some different um, things for a number of reasons. Um, one was the sort of, I guess, performative attitude to identity among young people, that they seem to be, um, not only the people in Melbourne, but when I spent time with some of the young people up at What Are We, they were sort of playing with different identities and different languages and sort of trying them out. Uh, for example, one young woman I've worked with a lot um, who works as a research assistant for me would sort of use an American accent when she was speaking English, like she was trying out a different character. And then last time I went up, although she usually speaks um, Gunwingu, she'd started trying out Maung and she started using bits of Maung and saying to me, what do you think of my Maung? And I heard her asking other people too. Um, like she was trying out, you know, a different sort of adult persona where she would be able to speak Maung as well. Um, the other thing, um, I guess, that really got me interested in it was this centenary of the mission event, which was um, held in June. And I'll show you a bit of this. Um, it was sort of like an eight day long um, event. Um, but the sort of key event, it seemed to me anyway, was this uh, reenactment of the arrival of the first missionary, where people acted out the different indigenous groups who were there. Um, also, there's been two PhDs published um, just within the last few months uh, by musicologists. Well, one's a linguist musicologist. Um, looking at musical diversity um, and sort of connecting that with languages and, and social groups and that kind of thing, um, which really made me think about all the labels people had been using uh, for names and different social groups and things like that uh, in the interviews. So I guess the main questions I was looking at is how do people interpret sameness and difference at what are we? So how do they sort of uh, create the diversity uh, that we see there? And why is it that language names and group names seem to be used in, in sometimes contradictory ways? Um, one of the things that I guess I was really stuck on was this earlier work on um, the connection between language and identity in Indigenous Australia. There was a lot of work um, showing that traditionally people didn't identify with the language exactly, but indirectly. So basically they'd identify with a clan and the clan owned certain land and that land was associated with a particular language, which they then owned through that clan membership. But it wasn't so much that they identified with a particular language um, directly. But then there was also work looking more recently at groups, for example, which don't speak their language anymore, which had man made land claims under the umbrella term of a language name. So actually shifting to seeing that as identifying a social group. Um, so I assume because the whole um, clan identity and, and all uh, stuff is very alive at Wadawi and people still own land um, and own it under the name of clans, um, that there would be the first kind of connection with language. But then I was often tripped up by the fact that people seem to be referring to languages as sort of social group labels, you know, saying like, you know, he's a good wingo, I'm Maung, that kind of stuff. But then at other times... Not, you know, doing quite different things. <clears throat> so this is just a photo um, of the um, of, of the people waiting actually just for the start of the reenactment um, on the beach, which um, the missionary first arrived at. He actually carved his name in a tree, which only fell over a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, he carved his initials into a tree. Um, and so these people are waiting. Um, there's a, a little dinghy coming in uh, with the missionary in it, um, with, with the you know, local minister playing a missionary. Um, and so as you can see, people wearing two colours of T-shirts. And this is what sort of got me thinking, is that you know, I'd been talking to people in interviews about all these different identities and you know, all these different languages that they identified with. 
Um, and then suddenly it seemed like everyone had divided into two, two groups. I mean, not everybody at Watery was in the performance, but most people were. Um, and so I was sort of intrigued in how people had sort of reorganised themselves into these two groups, um, which had written on the back um, Maningburu people uh, or Majakudu people. And these terms refer to actually groups of clans. Um, and the Maningburu people um, are the people who claim to have found the missionary wandering around the mainland um, and taken him over, brought him over to Watawi on dugout canoes. So they basically claim, um, you know, responsibility for that event um, and for, have, uh, for the, in a way for the establishment of the whole mission. Um, and then the Majakuta people, that's a name for a group of clans which owns um, Watawi itself, who were there um, supposedly when the Manning Buddha people brought the missionary over. Um, so that sort of intrigued me because, you know, I saw people, lots of people wearing T-shirts who, you know, came from much further afield and that kind of thing, and who hadn't previously mentioned to me that, you know, they identified with this group or that group. And also when I talked to people about the T-shirts and which one they wore, a lot of people actually referred to them using the language names Maung and Gunwingu. Um, so that also interested me that they were using these language names for these groups of people. Um, yeah, so basically what they reenacted was um, that when the Maningburu people came with the missionary, that the people who were there all ran off into the bush because they were a bit scared of the strangers, the strange man anyway. Um, and then what the Maningburu people was, they all called and said, came, come back, come back, um, he's all right, and that kind of thing. And so this is the missionary story, which had actually been told to me many times. And when I first went to Waterway, I really wanted to record traditional stories and that kind of thing. And everyone just wanted me to record the missionary story, and I used to get a bit annoyed about it. But I can see now why, what they were trying to get across a bit. It's just to understand how everybody came to the island, what they're doing there now. Because otherwise you go there and think, why are all these people living on this little island? Um, anyway, um, and just to sort of understand, you know, their different um, backgrounds as well, where they came from. Um, so, I guess... Sarah, yes? can I ask a question about that? Yes, you don't want to ask at the end? It, it's pertinent to that. Oh, sure, 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 ask. Um, there's a strong tradition, ceremonial tradition for owners and managers in mm -hmm. Aboriginal communities. I'm wondering if there's a replication of some of that. In this. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that's... That's what I got, I guess, particularly from these two musicology PhDs, is seeing the link um, with traditional ceremonies. Um, so traditionally, actually, they don't wear T-shirts of different colours, but traditionally um, at Watawi, they do wear cloth of different colours. Not like some areas where they have their own colour, like Eastern Arnhem Land, but actually they buy a different colour cloth each time, and it's just important that each group has the same colour, which, whichever colour it is. Um, and... Yes, I guess you could see the Majakutu as the sort of owners and then the Maningburu um, as, as visiting. Um, but it's interesting in a sense because you see Bunung who's directing the um, performance and they actually rehearsed it a couple of times as well uh, in the days before. Um, he actually um, identifies with the, um, the Maningburu, uh, with, with the mainland, um, with the people who brought the missionary. Um, but he's directing the whole event, and that's often his role. He's a, he's a sort of politician, but a, a sort of diplomat type, not the sort of hatchet man type, uh, who sort of works with all the different groups and brings them all together. There's actually a hatchet woman at Watawi, but anyway, <laughs> uh, who just goes around and makes people do things, <laughs> whether they want to or not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and even in terms of language, you know, it's, it's not very direct because of all the things that have happened because actually most people could, you know, would, would trace their identity patrilineally with the mainland. But because of that, I think other people have sort of shifted um, to be Maung. Otherwise, there wouldn't maybe be any Maung left just because a lot of men came from inland, I think. Um, so I guess one, one of the things I sort of took from this is that, you know, people would take a particular position in terms of what the context is. And in this context, there's two clearly defined groups because of the missionary story and because of, of how it worked. Um, and so people choose which one to take. Well, not exactly choose. Obviously, you know, other people have to find that convincing. But basically, I talked to different families um, about 
you know, which T-shirt, colour T-shirt their family wore and why. Um, and a lot of it had to do with these sort of broader polarities um, in terms of identifying more with the mainland or identifying with the island. Um, and obviously not everyone was in this Maningburu tribe or the Majakuru tribe who wore the T-shirts. Um, so that's what was interesting, is that they could still represent them in some way. Um, and most people explain that as, oh, you know, that's through this line in my family or that line. Um, but um, people also did see the languages as representing these polarities. And I think that sort of accounts for some of the use of, of language names to refer to what seem to be just social groups. Um, is this idea that it lines, aligns with this sort of mainland island um, thing. So this is um, just a Facebook post from um, one young woman, Delilah, who's in the middle here, uh, that she put up, um, which I thought was quite interesting um, because she talked about representing Maningburu Arakbi. So she's got the yellow um, Maningburu T-shirt on, so does her mother who's on her left. The white ones just ignore that's because they ran out of blue ones. They just made some white, they just had some white ones. But everybody, most people said that the white ones were blue ones. Mm -hmm. Then some people said maybe they were Gunbalang. <laughs> so they brought in another group. Um, but the people who were wearing them said they were blue. Um, and so she's talking about representing, and then she mentions her um, father's mother. So not exactly a patrilineal line. But so she's sort of um, tracing this uh, Maningburu connection through her family um, and sort of talking, talking about that, which I thought was interesting, um, is that, you know, um, I guess I hadn't really thought about, you know, the idea that you represent, you have all these different options available to you, re you represent one in the particular context. Um, so I actually, um, I talked about this already, but yeah, I just mentioned earlier on this traditional analysis of the connection between social identity and language in indigenous, um, in the indigenous world, which anthropologists spent a long time arguing it because basically all the early anthropologists assumed that everyone who spoke the same language was the same social group. And it took a long time for the, you know, controversy to resolve that actually that was just, you know, a projection of some European nation state idea. Um, and actually language didn't define social groups at all. Um, and so in a sense, the anthropologists work along, spent, put a lot of effort into getting here, but in a sense, at the same time as they were doing that, people were moving, um, I think, to also, at least at what are we, it's, it's two alternatives, whereas in other areas it has, it has shifted to actually people identifying directly with language and saying, we're this, and certainly around Melbourne, where I live, people will say, you know, I'm Yorta, Yorta, or whatever, and that's a language name. And in a sense, I guess the projections of these early colonialists became a reality. And partly that is because the same reasons that happened at Watawi is because they have actually administered and controlled people according to this belief that the people who spoke the same language, um, or not necessarily spoke it because they didn't even know, but they'd ask people, what's your language, and they'd talk about their language ownership, people who sort of own the same language are uh, the same group. And this is something that was going on at Watawi actually when I first got there. Um, there was, um, I guess it was a self, still, still the end of the self-determination era where the community had its own council which basically ran things. And on the council they had seats for Gunwingu, Maung and Gunbalang. And they were basically groups that the missionaries set up as a way to sort of negotiate with people politically. Um, and people who identified as one could then vote in their representatives. And so if you wanted to have any say, you had to claim to be part of one of those you know, language groups. And so I think this has had an influence now. Um, and possibly there was always you know, that alternative connection with the language as well, but it wasn't very important. So um, there seem to be these multiple options for how people connect, collect, connect language with their identity at Watawi. Now, the idea that identities are multifaceted, performative, <coughs> contextual is not new, but it still leaves you with the question of how to analyse apparently conflicting ways of using language names. Um, and this is something that the Crossroads people have also found. I've just got some quotes from Friederike here about, you know, taking a similar journey, um, in a sense, between asking people about their language identity 
and then looking at what they're doing and then also finding that they're talking about, talking about their language identity in different ways down the track. Um, so I'll just read it out. For us as researchers working in the multilingual ecologies of Lower Casamance, the first important step was to recognise the symbolic nature of essentialist language ideologies and look beyond them. So I guess this is when you talk to someone, say, what's your language? And they'll say, I'm a such and such. And this is interestingly something that had come out of earlier language surveys at What Are We? I found one the school had done in their files. And they'd said to people, what's your language? And these highly multilingual people had just named one language. Because if that's what you're looking for, they can give it to you. <laughs> um, so obviously that wasn't very informing for the school. <laughs> um, and the second quote um, about how the, I guess, perspective developed, an understanding of this crucial difference to Western language ideologies made it possible to see the coexistence of indexical and essentialist ideologies as a dialectic strategy rather than a contradiction. So I guess, in a sense, yes, I didn't want to sort of say, well, people are contradicting each other. That doesn't seem to make for a very interesting account. <laughs> um, but to see how people use different, I guess, um, ways of talking about their connection with language um, and how to, I guess, um, create um, a coherent story about that. Um, so I guess from phase three, my main finding was that language names are often used to refer to social groups, not linguistic practices. And when I was interviewing people, I guess I sort of fell for local language ideologies. And that when people talked about languages, and I'd say, what languages do you think should be spoken at Warawi? And they'd say, Maung, Gunwingo, and Gunbalang. And I'd think, oh, yeah, or what languages are even spoken at Warawi? They'd say that. And I'd think, oh, that's weird, because there's a lot of other languages as well. And, you know, Gunbalang isn't really spoken anymore. Um, that people were talking about who should be politically important, you know, because that was their, their groups, basically. So also, each performative context, such as this reenactment of the missionary, a video or an interview even creates a symbolic field and in that symbolic field there's different configurations of language identity that people might choose and there's different um, ways of presenting themselves. So in a way coming to this sort of approach which is more linguistic anthropology than sociolinguistics of multilingualism it's given me some explanatory power I feel although obviously it's still developing a bit um, and also it's made me made it more easier for me to com make comparisons with other sites, I felt. Because before I felt like I was saying, oh, it's so different at Waterway, everything's so different. And people, and that's not, doesn't make a very interesting talk, I felt in a way. Um, <laughs> you know, and so now I feel like I can find parallels in terms of other work on, for example, social and linguistic polarities, like this polarity that was set up between the yellow and the blue t-shirts. Um, the place of language ideologies, and also this idea of ethnicized localities. Because these clan groupings, which they used in the reenactment, are sort of, in a way, projections of localities, of where people's ancestors owned land and that kind of thing. Projecting it onto, I guess, the current, in a way, a diaspora at Warawi, even though they're still on indigenous owned land, most of them are not, you know, even sometimes visiting, you know, their ancestral lands, um, which are a few hundred kilometres away. Um, so I guess I started to think maybe it is necessary to reinvent the wheel, even though I feel like I haven't discovered anything new except rediscovered what other people have already concluded in their research so that language ideologies <coughs> are fictions, interviews are performances, identities are multifaceted and any perspective is, is partial. Um, I think maybe it's necessary to rediscover that in every field site um, and I did move from a simpler to a more complex analysis um, but I feel like in a way the complexities I have to continually reinvent them because even myself um, continually falling in the trap of sort of simplifying things. Um, and I think this is partly because as researchers and even as subjects who are being interviewed and that kind of thing, um, we're trying to create a coherent story. And so we do fall into traps, for example, like linguistic nationalism, like seeing uh, the language as identifying a group and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, we create these, you know, for example, with this reenactment with the Maung and Gumingo being associated with the T-shirt. So I think in a sense, it's not just like you have to discover these things once, but you have to keep on, I guess, discovering them. Um, and that's the end. Sorry, I went a little bit long. Uh, just thanks to some of the people I've collaborated with. Sorry? Did, did they speak 
two languages or the children? The children, yeah. Most of the children are already speaking two languages. And what are they? Mum's language and dad's language, or, 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 or um, most? It's mostly mum and dad. Um, most of the children I interviewed um, were speaking either Maung and Gunwingal or Maung and Yulungmata. The Maung and Yulungmata was mainly from mum and dad language. The Gunwingal can come in sort of from different ways. Often the parents are bilingual, or there'll be one grandparent who wants them to speak Gunwingal or something like that. Um, so it's a bit more complex, but Maung and Yulungmata, it's just recently, Nancy and Richard were kind of a little bit rebellious in marrying across that border between East and West Arnhem Land. And just in the last 10 years, probably, it's a lot more people have got married with East, the Western Arnhem Landers from Rowa, we have got married with Eastern Arnhem Landers. So with the children, it was more mum and dad, yeah. This one? I think there's a, another kind of layering as well, which is, is political. Mm. Um, I mean, there's local politics, but there's also uh, national politics going on. Mm. Um, and this whole thing about uh, language and identity and so on, it's, it's all part of land rights and mm. <coughs> legislation in Australia that's been yeah. around for 40 years. Yeah. And the maps that circulate, the Tinder mm, map, mm -hmm, the, yep. the, what's the map I, sh I skipped past as well, this one like that. The later one by, uh, was put out by the Institute. Right? Yeah, so yeah. They're all la they're language names based. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. And to some extent, I think Aboriginal communities have adopted those, um, those rhetorical stances that have been taken by the yeah. broader politics. Mm. The land right, you know, the land councils as well as the, the mm. sort of white man thing. And I wonder if there isn't also a, a, ret a rhetoric, a story, because you, with that particular performance you showed us, mm. because there's the official church filming and stuff mm. that's going on at the same time. Interesting to see that. So <coughs> it's reproducing that rhetoric, that that story, that political um, statement. And the lovely thing here is that it actually coincides with the traditional bifurcation that mm. we were talking about before of the owner-manager. You know, any mm. ceremony has to have the people who own it mm. will actually carry it out. Mm. So here's a wonderful example where they've actually correlated the broader political sets of agendas with their own local traditional yeah. cultural organisation of ceremonial activities. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things is um, the whole story of the first missionary. How did it come about? Was it a purely Indigenous thing or did church people collaborate on it early on and, and enjoy telling this story or whatever? I'm not sure. Um, but certainly the stuff with the T-shirts. I talked to Rosemary Rubadi who um, organised the production of the T-shirts and that wasn't... An, and I also talked to Lindsay who's performing there as a missionary. And the T-shirts came from, from Rosemary, from local people. That was her idea, she said. And um, what was written on them was her idea as well. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was quite interesting. I mean, a lot of the stuff was sort of church-run in terms of setting up the stage and stuff and flying people in, but um, the reenactment seemed to be pretty much locally produced, although Lindsay enjoyed playing the missionary. <laughs> yep. Um, I want to come back to your reception, uh, receptive multilingualism mode. Uh, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that it may be, in fact, uh, a way or a tool to uh, <coughs> lead to retardation of language death or language shift. Mm. Um, what sort of longitudinal data do you have on that one? Well, um, there's. Um well, nothing really at Wadawi, but just from around Australia, there's a lot of reports uh, of it being a long-standing practice. Um, so even one of the reports from an early settler who was just travelling from Sydney and he had an Indigenous guide with him. And when they got 40 miles from Sydney, <coughs> the Indigenous guide met another Indigenous person and he said, oh, that's interesting because he seems to understand the other guy's language, but he talks to him in his language, in the Sydney language. So that's sort of like a very early 
post-contact, I guess, documentation, but I guess other work in other Indigenous communities around Northern Australia also talks about, um, talk about this practice. Does it does it yeah, maintain? A, I mean, yeah. I think it's a fascinating thing. And yeah. I think there is something in it, but you would want to have some longitudinal data in a particular group that yeah. young people, for example, don't yeah. in the end move over to a form of Aboriginal English or yeah. other English, and in fact use that other one. So I just wondered whether you had any data on that. Yeah. Um, well, it'll be interesting to see. I think with the young people, um, but. Yeah, um, just, you know, from participant observation, it doesn't seem to me like they're moving towards speaking English all the time. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I follow up comment more than a question because, I mean, it has been similarly... Um, be said about multilingualism leading to language shift. Yeah. And very often it can lead to language shift. So that's a, uh, an interesting parallel to receptive multilingualism, which is often observed in, the, in situations mm. of language shift, but at the same time, mm. as you argue, can actually foster yeah. language survival. And a similar observations hold for multilingual contexts um, mm. that are often seen actually as instances of language shift, but when you look closer, mm. are actually remnants of multilingual situations. So uh -huh. the multilingualism is getting lost. <laughs> mm, yeah. And so <coughs> the importance seems to be a particular socialization pattern mm. that makes that a normal pattern of interaction for people into which they are socialized. Mm. And so my question is, um, to what extent is this based on particular language? <coughs> I mean, you know, it's related to your question. Or to what extent is that actually more like an abstract template? Mm. So yeah. you can use that with any, any part of your repertoire. Because I'm asking because this is something that we find um, in the Lower Casamance, is that it seems more important to have this idea that you can speak several mm. small languages. And in several small languages, it's not a luxury, you know. Uh, mm. and a pointless indulgence to have these several small languages. <coughs> if you're used to that, then mm. you're used to being multilingual and that's your normal situation. Yeah, no, I think that's certainly the case because, you know, if you compare what are we to other Indigenous communities, um, it's not the case that languages haven't been lost. So, for example, Gunbalang is only spoken by older people, Iwaija, yeah. also only very few older people. So languages have been lost, but also languages have come in, like mm. Yulgamat, to which yeah. they never would have spoken before in English. Um, and so I think, um, yes, it is. It is sort of habit of multilingualism, and it seems to be something which, particularly speakers of small languages, seem to have, yeah. because obviously they would have always had to have it. Yeah. Whereas perhaps some of these speakers of big languages, that's another reason, perhaps, why uh, these Yulngamat speakers don't speak Maung, mm -hmm. is because um, although they were very multi-varietal, multi um, you know, they had this large area of Eastern Arnhem Land and they actually wouldn't have, you know, some of them wouldn't have come into contact with speakers of completely different languages um, traditionally. Any other questions? I think you may have kind of answered this one when you were talking to Peter, but the, during the ceremony, the Gumbalan speakers were wearing yellow. Um, it was just a coincidence that the, when they were doing their language profiles, the girl who identified as mostly Gunbalang coloured her person in yellow. Did I say Gunbalang there, did I? Or is that what I, I just misremembered? No, that would have been Gunwingo. Oh, Gunwingo. Okay. Yeah. So it is. Actually. No, that's what I talked to them about that. I'm like, what? Because we did their language profiles in Melbourne, then it was school holidays, and we all went up to Warui at the same time, and they had the reenactment, and then they came back to Melbourne, and I'm like, what's with these colours? And then I talked to Rosemary about how, why did you choose blue and yellow? It seems to be a complete coincidence. Like, okay. I mean, Rosemary said she chose. <laughs> Rosemary said she chose yellow because that represents the mainland, and blue because it represents the island because it's in the sea. Mm. So possibly there was something going on there, but you don't see that colour symbolism a lot up there. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, they said it's complete coincidence. That's what they told me. So, um, yeah. Was that all the question, or did I miss a bit of it? Yeah, it was just relating too much. <laughs> no, 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 I, I was exactly going down the same path. Yeah, another question regarding the um, 
colorings. So, I mean, the, they're intriguingly complex and, and personal, of mm. course. Um, I was wondering, because you said that you can generalize and that it has often been found that people um, draw color the languages that are the most important or close mm. to them, close to the chest or the head. If it's actually possible based on these portraits um, to draw generalizations on repertoires, shapes of repertoires? Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably, although they, there is often strange omissions as well, you know. A lot of it, I think, is to do with what languages people feel are directly connected to them. Mm -hmm. So that's why they often won't put English in, because mm -hmm. uh, they feel it's a language that's out there that they speak. Mm -hmm. And also, um, one of the people I interviewed um, mm -hmm. didn't put um, Yulnamata in that, but it turns out he speaks it fluently. But because he's from Western Arnhem Land, he doesn't see that it's part of his repertoire, I guess, part of him. It just came out in the interview that he, um, him and his wife were reenacting this story where we, he was playing the nephew who speaks Yulamut and he started speaking. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, it's interesting because in terms of the, um, the other linguists who've used this language portrait method, which people are using quite a few different places, although it started, I think, uh, from people working in bilingual schools, um, is they sort of say, well, what kind of object is it in terms of analysis? Mm -hmm. And there is this whole visual sociology now, which is a bit beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in a way you have to sort of... Mm, I think for myself, I'm not taking it too seriously. <laughs> I think it's really interesting part of the interview process. Not everyone wanted to do it. Um, particularly adults, and I say, no, I don't want to colour something in. But um, it's a good part of the interview process because people start off with a non-verbal task, so they don't feel like they're sort of under the hammer straight away and they're forced to talk. Um, and also it's useful for presentations, I think it's a nice depiction. Um, and it's interesting for me, but I think in terms of analysing them, I'm not quite sure how far you can yeah, take it. <laughs> that might be it then, what do you think? <laughs> well, thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody. As usual, I will be at the Institute of Education, so please join us if you want to continue to talk to Ruth over a drink. And then, if you would like to join us at about six at the Mulder Arms, uh, if you have portable torchlights with you, please bring them. There is apparently some electrical issues <laughs> there. We're calling it ambient lighting, but it should still be fine. They hope that it's all finished by the time we get there. We will still be able to talk and have a drink or some chips in the pub regardless of what it is like. Um, so that will be at six at the Marlborough Arms. I will be at the IOE. I will happily lead a walking train over to the Marlborough Arms. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.